hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Brenna. I, I'm from Toronto in Canada, and I'm a front engine front-end engineer at TED. But before that, I actually taught at a front-end development boot camp for a year. Um, I want to tell you a little story about something that happened there that came to be known as the Oprah Circle. So the very first time we ran this boot camp, everything was sort of experiment. We were feeling it out as we went along, and uh, we kind of followed the normal course you would. Started out with a couple weeks of HTML and CSS, followed by a few weeks of JavaScript. Um, and then and something happened in the weeks immediately following JavaScript. There was a weird tension hanging over the entire classroom. We got this feeling that we had like defeated people. And so we decided we needed to do something. We staged an intervention of sorts. We gathered all of our 27 or so students in a circle, and we asked them all to share a highlight of the course so far, followed by a low light, and then another highlight. So the low lights ranged from things you would expect, like, I don't get to see my friends and family as much, or I have a long commute. But about half of my students gave me a one-word answer, JavaScript. JavaScript was a low light for them. And, and this absolutely broke my heart, because the JavaScript community is personally where I have felt like the most inspired, the most supported, the most welcome in my own journey as a front-end developer. And I wanted to know, why aren't these people who are new to our industry feeling the love? Why haven't they seen the good parts of the community? But if you think about it, this isn't that surprising. Learning to code is a hard, challenging thing to do. There are barriers involved. So today, I want to talk about those barriers. Some of them are technical, and some of them are cultural. And I want to talk about the solutions to help overcome them for the newest members of our community. One thing that I think is really critical to remember is that many newcomers to JavaScript are new to the world of programming in a lot of ways. This happens really frequently and increasingly because the demand for JavaScript developers is so high, and we have a huge influx of people that are coming in from non-traditional backgrounds and lacking maybe formal computer science training. I think many of us sort of build up our JavaScript knowledge like this. We're able to get the job done and like ship something out, but in essence, we're lacking a solid foundation beneath that. One great strategy for dealing with this is just to read a book that covers these fundamental topics. And there's actually a ton of them available online for free. So whether this be for yourself or to recommend to somebody who's kind of struggling building those foundations, this is a good resource. Eloquent JavaScript in particular, a lot of people have said they've had good success with that. And when you're lacking these foundations, it fundamentally comes down to a communication problem. How often do we tell people oh, you have a problem in your code? Just Google it. And while it's true that most of the answers are out there somewhere in the internet, how can somebody formulate a, an intelligent question and find their way there if they don't use the correct terminology, if they don't speak the language? So this, I found, was happening with a lot of my students. We just weren't seeing eye to eye as far as talking about the concepts that we were trying to debug. So I used a little technique I've come to call hooked on syntax. So something like this, pretty simple line of code. Maybe if you are you know, reasonably proficient in JavaScript, you can read that and sort of parse out what it does immediately in your head. But for a beginner, you have to interpret all this. That's a lot that you're doing implicitly. So I literally would sit with students and say, OK, let's sound this out word by word. Var, what is that? That's a keyword that exists in JavaScript. And it says, hey, I'm going to go create a variable. Max number, what is that? And you know, I know that that's something that I made up. I got to name that. But that's not something that's always clear to a beginner. So um, you really have to be patient with people as they're going through things like this. And this was actually like a, a tough thing for me to do as a teacher. Like, I struggle to be patient. It's so tempting when somebody has a problem to say, oh, yeah, here's the answer. I'll give it to you. But they're never going to learn like that. One thing that actually infuriates me the most is when I see a more experienced developer come over to someone else's computer and literally take over and type on it. You need to let that person, as painstaking as it might be, type things out really slowly for themselves, and actually learn and internalize and make their own mistakes. 
And returning to this idea of keeping track of a lot of language and syntax and terminology, we really need to remember that this is not a test. We're brought up with this culture of memorization all throughout, like most of our traditional schooling. We learn something, and then we're tested on it, and usually we just have to memorize the thing that we're being tested on. But this is not in any way like a typical programmer's workflow. Personally, I have the syntax for something like a for loop memorized because I've written it thousands of times. But I've never sat there with like, flashcards and memorized what the syntax for a for loop is. But for some reason, people who are entering just don't seem to like, get that. They feel this pressure that they have to memorize it. So I want you to tell people it's OK to look it up. There's no shame in looking something up that you don't know. And let's provide them with resources to do this. Um, this is just like a quick cheat sheet I threw together for some of my students, because I could tell that they were just overwhelmed with, with all of this. And it really helped kind of having that security blanket, in essence, there. So share these resources with people or create them yourself. Another challenge for a lot of beginners is especially, especially for people coming in from HTML and CSS, that has a lot of immediate feedback and visual output. So JavaScript can be really dry and abstract and boring. One thing I think we need to do is like stop using foo and bar, extremely abstract things in our example. Use something with context that actually means someone to somebody, means something to someone. You know, if I see black and orange, I understand that those are both colors and they're related, and it helps me grok the concept that it, an array is a collection of related items. The thing with this, too, is it's also memorable. So who recognizes this? It's a closing brace, closing parenthesis, and a semicolon. It's a familiar pattern that we see at the end of a lot of callback functions. And if you're experienced, you recognize this. To a beginner, you miss one piece of punctuation, and everything stops. And you see syntax error on line 24. And which one of these is missing? Who knows? So how do you get somebody to kind of build the memory for that signature, recognize this, and know that this is the correct way to do it? You give it a silly nickname. If you ask any one of the like 100 or so people that I taught JavaScript to last year, they will all immediately tell you that this is the frowny, winky neckbeard. <laughs> um, similarly, dollar sign friends came to be known as jQuery Activate. Because when you have something and you want to be able to use jQuery methods on it, you need to activate the jQuery by swaddling it in dollar signs and parentheses. So the moral of this is just to have fun with it. I think you're all an incredibly fun bunch of people when I meet you in person. So why not bring that liveliness into our online examples and, and just sort of make ourselves more memorable to beginners? All right, so time for another problem. If you've got your fundamentals down, you know the mechanics of how things work. A ton of people really struggle with tackling a larger problem. They say, where do I start? It's sort of like learning to use a saw and a hammer and a tape measure individually. And then all of a sudden, someone says, build me a bookcase. Where do I start with that? And I think this is actually where a lot of online tutorials miss the mark, is they teach you the mechanics, but they don't teach you the art of problem solving. That's a skill that, once you're an experienced developer, you gain. So I think we need to teach people to think like a computer. Try and get them to break down a complex problem into discrete steps. Basically, you want to get them writing pseudocode. And that way, you're giving them little baby portions to chew off one piece at a time that they can match up with their toolkit a little easier. And I think we can do stuff in our community to facilitate that and give people an environment where they can take on those bigger problems and have support through sort of working through the stages. Um, this is a picture from Node School Toronto. Node School is a fantastic organization that is in tons of cities, and it's easy to start your own chapter if there isn't one where you live, where anyone's welcome to come and either work through a tutorial or hack on their own projects 
And it's completely casual and informal, but there's support there. There's experienced developers, there's peers to help them through that and sort of learn, you know, that more difficult art of actually working through real world problems that you're solving with JavaScript. What this comes down to, in essence, even though a lot of these are sort of more technical strategies, is this is about being welcoming to newcomers, just really taking them under your wing and helping them get oriented in what is kind of a strange new world if you've never seen JavaScript before. So let's assume our foundation is built. We know how to use all our tools and when to use them. You're eventually going to come up against this. It's so great that a lot of us have passion about JavaScript and how to write it, but with all these strong opinions flying around, this is what it feels like. People get totally concerned about what's the right way to do it. I've seen it so bad to the point where people are scared to write down, type in any code, because they're afraid to do it the wrong way. Now, part of this is JavaScript itself. Our lovely little language has so many instances where there are literally just multiple ways to accomplish the same task. And this happens on a macro scale as well. I think it's incredibly healthy that we have a rich ecosystem of frameworks and tooling, but this can get extremely overwhelming when you're just faced with all these choices and you're not sure which one is what you should be using. Beyond this, it's really not helpful when we're constantly critiquing people for using last year's model. I think we just need to, in a lot of ways, let go of the idea of there being one true way to do something. Encourage beginners to just pick a method, pick a framework, and give it a try. If you don't like it or if it doesn't work for you, then try something new. You know, um, If it gets the job done, in my opinion, that's the right choice. Let people learn for themselves what like, maybe the pitfalls of using something is on their own. Let them learn their lessons. Where I think we have done a good job of sort of helping people with this paradox of choice is through things like code style guides and best practices. People are really looking for guidance here. I heard this answer over and over and over again that I just don't know which thing to do. So give them guidance. These are great tools to use either as if you're learning on your own, someone comes at you with an opinion, you say, no, I did it this way because the Airbnb JavaScript style guide said so. Like, shut that down. Um, also, if you're leading a team where you're managing a bunch of junior developers, Implement something like this so you can stop people arguing on your team and just get down to like writing J JavaScript together as a team. And if you're outside of these formal places where it's allowed to set the one true way, we all need to just bite our damn tongues. I mean, this has probably happened to a lot of other people in the audience. I know it's happened to me. You post a piece of code online and all of a sudden, you have like opinions flying at you about, oh, you should do it this way instead. Have you considered doing that? Instead, why not, we, why not say something like, can I give you a suggestion instead of just flying at someone with the way that you think it's supposed to be done? If you start a conversation like this, you're going to just like open up a dialogue where you can talk constructively about maybe the benefits and drawbacks of different options without it being so hostile. And when you are giving help to someone, writing a blog post, um, GitHub issue, Stack Overflow answer, I think we need to choose our words really wisely. There's a great blog post by Chris Coyer about words to avoid in educational writing. Like I say, educational writing is really anything, be it blog post, Stack Overflow answer. If you use words like obviously, just, simply, you're implying that that task is easy. But the audience for these things are beginners. It's not easy for them. And by using these words, you've completely trivialized their struggle. Most of the times, if you take them out of your sentence, it reads the exact same as well anyhow. So just don't do that. What this is is just empathy, really. You just need to try and remember what it was like when you were learning. And there's psychology there that the further you get from your beginner stage, the more expert you become. It's actually just harder to remember what it was like when you were a beginner. 
But I urge you all to just try before you answer somebody who's in a more junior position, just take a second and try and see their perspective of where they're coming from. This also applies with documentation. Uh, it's a rather famous quote from Kathy Sierra. If you want them to RTFM, make a better FM. <laughs> I literally do not think I've ever heard somebody complain about documentation being too easy to understand. <laughs> so why not just make it accessible to everybody? I know it's not everybody's favorite task, but it is so, so critical. And there's resources out there like Write the Docs that can help you with this. All of this is, to me, the idea of being supportive instead of just critiquing. We want to be offering up resources and encouragement. And so I also think we need to just like go out of our way to be encouraging to other people. <laughs> I'll let you all take that in a couple more times. <laughs> um, you know, I think in general, humans are faster to offer up a negative opinion than a positive one. We tend to hold that back. So just be encouraging, whether that's in the form of like a high five when someone's debugging something and they get it to work. Um, celebrate the small wins. Tell somebody if you think they did something great. I'm sure they would love to hear it. Um, and sometimes that also means just giving somebody a gentle nudge, <laughs> pushing them outside of their comfort zone. Um, there are so many people that have done this to me when I, I thought, no, I can't talk at a conference. I don't have anything to say. I don't have anything anyone wants to hear. I think Brian summed this up really well this morning. Um, but yeah, try and push people out of their comfort zone and encourage them to, to take leaps. OK, so one more big thing I think I need to address. A lot of people feel like this. As they continue in their journey, they've learned a lot of foundations. They've maybe like been able to deal with the negative opinions coming in. But the more you see the industry, I think for a lot of people, they start to feel like they don't quite fit in here. So sometimes it's literally, I don't look like you. I don't look like a developer. But even regardless of that, I think all of us have been fed this false narrative that in order to be successful as a developer, as a JavaScripter, you need to devote your entire life to code. You're not allowed to have outside hobbies. You'll never get ahead if you're not coding every single night. And I just really think this is entirely false. One of my students um, went through the boot camp I later became friends with her, and she got a job at like a fairly well-known local agency. On the book, she was very successful in her like budding career as a web developer, but personally, she confided in me that she was thinking of quitting. She said, I'd like to make something with my hands. But I want to maybe just go into woodworking and do that instead. Instead. To her, it was a binary option. She couldn't be a JavaScript developer, and do something like this on, on the side. And I said, no, 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 wait, it's OK. I know developers who are carpenters. <laughs> um, if anyone knows Wilto, Matt Marquis, he used to be a carpenter. He still does it on the side. He's done great talks about how that influences his JavaScript work. Um, there are also developers who are into perfectly clear ice. <laughs> and how do I know this? I know this because they freely volunteer that information on Twitter publicly. <laughs> but I think that's great. I think no of us are expert. We should all just not be shy about who we are in our lives outside of JavaScript and share your lovely, unique selves. Because I fundamentally believe that each and every one of you is totally awesome. <laughs> yeah, clap for yourselves. <laughs> By having unique interests and knowledge from outside JavaScript or computer science, we all bring something incredibly unique to the table, and I think we're better off as an industry for it. Diverse people are going to look at things in different ways and solve diverse problems. And where I think the magic really happens is when we take our interests and hobbies and combine them with JavaScript to make truly inspiring things that appeal to a much wider audience. Uh, Jen Schiffer, for example, loves art, loves pixel art, and so she does that online. She makes a lot of art with JavaScript. 
I'm also incredibly inspired by our determination to use JavaScript outside the browser. Node happened not too long ago when we said, you know what? Hey, we, we're stuck with JavaScript. I think, I think it sort of started where all of us were stuck with JavaScript because it's the only thing that runs in the browser. And then this cool thing happened where we're like, we're just going to put it elsewhere and run with it. And so we got Node with JavaScript on the server. And then we got Node bots with JavaScript running on Arduino boards. And then we have people like Cassandra Perch, who has always been into sewing since she was a kid, and now she makes wearables that are controlled by JavaScript. And this idea of JavaScript, all the things, just keeps growing and growing. I never imagined that I'd see JavaScript on a knitting machine, but Mariko did this. Hopefully, you all saw her talk at Reject.js. Um, and there's just so many examples of this, and I find it so incredibly inspiring. All of these people that I just showed you, and so, so many others that I don't have time to mention, have inspired me to stick with JavaScript rather than any other language. They've inspired me to continue learning when I felt like I knew nothing, to work on interesting side projects in my spare time when I didn't have the motivation. And it's why I'm standing here talking to you today. Me and I think so many other people in this room just really finally felt I have a place where I belong. So to me, those are the good parts. We're welcoming in terms of helping people build a solid foundation and building communities. We're supportive when we reserve judgment and offer encouragement instead. And we're inspiring by just being cool, awesome people and making really interesting things with JavaScript all over. But not everybody knows this yet. Not everyone has had the chance to come to a conference like this and see the good parts. So my call to all of you is to take whatever you see as the good parts of this community and share it beyond these walls. <laughs> Thank you.